Hello and welcome to a very, very special episode of the Game Informer Show. I'm your host, Ben Hansen, joined by <laughs> Tim Turry. Oh, hello. Welcome back, Tim. Yeah, thanks. It's a special episode. That's why you're back here. Yeah, we've been working on this for a while. That's true. So what this is, we both love the first Metal Gear Solid a lot. One of my favorite games of all time. In fact, we love all of Metal Gear Solid. They are so good. But I appreciate a good deep dive. So what this is going to be is a deep dive into the actual recording process of the first Metal Gear Solid. Known for some of the best voice acting in all video games, especially in 1998. Certainly some of the most fun. So we have a certain someone to help us tell this story. Good morning. Hey, Chris, how's it going? Uh, hi, I'm Chris Zimmerman Salter, and I was the casting and voice director for the first Metal Gear Solid. And I'm happy to say that I have been the voice director on the project since the very first one. I've done all the games. And just to set up what's happening here, Chris is going to be joining us along this entire journey. So she is a real rock to the entire Metal Gear Solid recording process. So don't be surprised when you hear her voice popping up throughout the episode. She got her start in voice acting direction in a place you might not expect it, Hanna-Barbera, known for its cartoons. And when I finished telling them what I wanted, they did it. And it was like an addiction. <laughs> it, it, it was like a dance. It was just, it was wonderful and I loved it. I think my first game was called Blazing Dragons. Knights of the Square Table, defend our family jewels! I got a phone call from a lady named Keiko Ono who was, had a very thick Japanese accent and she worked for some I don't even remember the name of the production company, and she called me in for an interview. So what was the pitch then uh, from Konami? What did they tell you about this project early on? Nothing. <laughs> what? We're making a game. It was a game called Metal Gear, and there might have been a mention of a guy named Snake. And at Hanna-Barbera, she worked for legendary voice director Gordon Hunt, who has done a gazillion things. You might know him the best from working on the Uncharted series. Yeah, and that's a huge voice acting pedigree to come from. That's right. And so he also apparently applied to be the voice director on Metal Gear Solid 1. Oh, wow. But it was the first time I beat him out on a job. And it was like exciting, a little bit exciting for me that I had reached that level of competence. I said yes, and there you go. But the trick was I was hired to be the director, not the casting director. And also the project at the time was non-union. So when they hired me, I said... I would like to give you about 20 names of actors that I'd like to audition. And they said, oh, of course, fine, fine, please, please. So I brought in my 20 people. When the cast finally came to fruition, all but one of my actors got parts. None of us, even the actors, none of us knew what we were getting into. Hello, Cam? This is he. So the voice you're hearing here is Cam Clark. You know him from a thousand things. He's Leonardo from the Ninja Turtles. He's Canada from the English dub of Akira. Uh, and just go to his IMDb page. He has just a gazillion credits. Just set it on auto scroll and then just uh, put a pizza in the oven. Pour I yourself guess. a glass of wine. Absolutely. He's done a lot. But most importantly here, he's the voice of Liquid Snake. Oh, yeah. I've known Chris since... Golly, since the 1880s. First time I worked with Chris, I think, was Captain Planet. Help! Captain Planet! You gotta save us! So, Chris, what were your early impressions of working with Cam Clark? It's fabulous. <laughs> I'm sure I read for multiple parts. I'm sure I read for Solid as well. I mean, I would write on the top of my audition papers, you know, certain key words of, you know, back in my day, whether it was John Travolta or... Sly Stallone or Matthew Broderick. Were there key references uh, and voices for the voice of Liquid then? How much of it is Matthew Broderick, I think, is the core of my question. <laughs> <laughs> well, Father gave you all the good genes, and I was left with bits and pieces. How do you think that makes me feel, dear brother? <laughs> Why do you think your cast is the bad guys so often? Because I'm the baby in my family, and we're evil. Cam knows how to savor the scene. He knows how to suck in the listener and then attack. You know, of course, all villains are British. Was it called out? Not a stereotype, just true. <laughs> was it called out in the script that he was British or was that your own addition? I mean, I would think it was my own thing, which is kind of odd if your twin brother is American. 
unless uh, it's like the video game version of the parent trap. You know, he's pretty much a stock villain voice, you know. Uh, he just didn't have a cape, you know, and a twirly mustache. Once we get the DNA and the money, the world will be ours. Hey. Hello. And this is Christopher Randolph, who you may know better as. Otacon. <laughs> <laughs> They were having me read for a role for a character called Snake. And I went into the booth and I did my best at Snake, which, <laughs> as we all know now, was almost certainly pathetic. Although I kind of wish I could hear that audition. Uh, and Chris said through the microphone, uh, hang on, hang on a second, don't leave. And I could see through the glass there was this... Uh, <laughs> this kind of conference uh, between a, a number of Japanese people and Chris, and they were all sort of talking. And then a second later, Chris came and opened the booth and handed me uh, more copy and another picture. Christopher is a little bit of a... Um, hmm, how do I phrase this? I swear to you, I looked at the picture, right, and I... I it, it was astoundingly the way I look if I'm wearing my glasses, if I had had long hair. Blue hair. And it was like, oh, my God. He can put on the skin of being that intelligent, awkward guy really, really well. I had no idea what it was or how it worked or anything. It was really my very, very first voiceover job. It's me, Snake. Otacon. How'd you get here? Well, it wasn't as dramatic as your entrance, believe me. Oh, hi. My name is uh, Debbie Mae West. I played Meryl in Metal Gear Solid. I think that's what we're here to talk about. You talk too much. You haven't even taken the safety off, rookie. I told you I'm no rookie. So you just want to set the scene maybe for like what you're up to in 1998 and how you first came across the Metal Gear Project? Oh, gosh. Is that when it was? It was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, it's a long time ago. <laughs> He's still got Campbell, everybody. He's still not yeah, the Still here. Uh. <laughs> Paul Eiding, another memorable voice actor. Uh, you may know him from one of the first voices you hear in Fallout 4. vault calling. Or you might remember him from something a little bit older. You must construct additional pylons. Is that really you? That's in the me. first StarCraft? Mm -hmm. Paul is just a fabulous character actor, and he can do anything from the silly, goofy a kind of nerdy uncle to this general that we all fell in love with. And he's Meryl's dad. <laughs> <laughs> but she called me in to uh, read for um, Colonel Campbell. It was a day like any other day. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so where did the voice come from? Um, well, I was a sergeant in the army. My stepfather was in the military. All my uncles were in the military. And I just wanted to have something with some gravitas just use the bottom bottom end of my voice because normally i talk like this high tech special forces unit foxhound your former unit and one that i was a commander of and now a man who needs no introduction what was i doing i was probably suffering uh somewhere <laughs> in hollywood i was very dispirited with the business and then uh, i got this call to come in and audition for the, the for this game metal gear so I was aware of him, and we got along pretty well right from the get-go. I went in. Chris Zimmerman was there, and all of the original artwork was on the walls. Now, I do remember that the day that I did bring David in, David happened to be wearing a white T-shirt, a pair of khakis, and a bandana. <laughs> It was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, they gave it to me. Uh, one of the producers said, look, Snake wears a bandana. And so um, they gave me a, I remember it, but I probably still have it. It was, a, um, it was a Budweiser bandana, but it was done in khaki or in camouflage. So one of them gave it to me and said, I, this, maybe this will help. So I was like, great. So. It was the key to your success. They saw that and they're like, well, that's it. This man's and That's in. right. So Chris, do you remember what any of the other... Uh, snake actors were going for were they all going for gruff and gravelly or what was their tone like it was kind of all over the place but i think it specifically asked for a a deeper toned voice you know but nobody quite brought the sandpaper that david Hayter did i'm friends with uh adam duritz and the guys from counting crows so they were recording the album this desert life 
up at a house in the Hollywood Hills. And so I went up to visit them because they had uh, free food. They had food <laughs> laid out, you know. And uh, I get a call on my, on my StarTAC cell phone. And it's Jennifer Hale, uh, whom you may know is one of the greatest voice actresses of our generation. And she goes, uh, guess who's going to make some money? And I was like, I really hope it's me. <laughs> and uh, Chris called me and said they want you to do um, the lead in this game, Metal Gear. So I was like, fantastic. And I remember I was sitting out by the pool and listening to the guys record. And, and uh, so that was a great moment. Did you then explain to the members of Counting Crows that you got a part in a video game called Metal Gear Solid? Probably. I'm sure I went in and told them and they, they didn't care. They, <laughs> <laughs> like what what all right yeah she brought together an incredible group i mean i had a solid cast i had a fantastically solid cast and so at this point do you have the full script or how did you first get access to that oh this is a really good story <laughs> you know the games that i had done the script was maybe a hundred pages right so this box is delivered to my home uh maybe the thursday before we were gonna start and I'm a pretty quick study. So I, you know, my Friday, I had to go to work. Saturday, we had a barbecue. Sunday, it's early afternoon. And I said, oh, um, I should probably look at my script. And I started pulling the, the stack out of the box. Now, this stack is over 12 inches high. And I started looking for, like, the colored paper that's going to indicate the the separation between the different scripts that are going to go to all the actors in this box as I'm slowly realizing that, no, this is the entire script is mine. And I've never read something so fast in my entire life. I liked it. It was well written. You know, there were there were interact character interactions that made sense. You know, it's it's Japanese. It's weird in places. And and. Uh, not only that, but it's so highly detailed in its research about genetics and the military and all the weaponry and all that stuff. So, you know, I could tell that the writer was, um, you know, a brilliant Japanese obsessive compulsive researcher who, who was really trying to say something. Kojima is an incredibly creative and intelligent man. I could tell that we were doing something that meant a lot to him and that he was really trying to say, say some things that, that I also felt were important. I thought it was going to be fun. I thought just the bulk of it was going to be the challenge, how much we had to get done. So can you describe the recording process and maybe kind of give a better lay of the land of what the actual recording studio was like? Uh, yeah, so it was a tiny, tiny studio, which was in a house. And it turned out that it used to belong to Valentino. He was a very, very famous, romantic, handsome actor. And so this is a very fancy mansion almost, right? Well, you would think. It was a house in Hollywood. And you would kind of park in the back and walk in through the kitchen <laughs> And then down the hallway was a sort of a studio. That had been converted and not very well. I guess the people that owned the house at the time had turned the living room into a screening stage. The studio was kind of tiered. So at the, on the bottom level was, was where we were standing with microphones and there was a TV so we could... Um, we, occasionally we had to match to picture. And then there was sort of a railing, if you will, and then different levels going up of um, tables, you know, and, and technical equipment. And we were as far away as we could get on the other side on a little platform. There must have been about eight of us. And these are sound tech guys, representatives from Konami, people from the production company because everyone was in the room, you just, you kind of felt like you really had an audience. So there was this kind of, uh, for me anyway, and it was also my first job, there was this kind of performance tension to it. Um, you know, almost like being on stage, uh, because there was this feeling of like, you know, gotta get it right. 
<laughs> That's why he's Otacon, I guess. Right. <laughs> yeah. He's easily intimidated. Yeah, you mentioned um, he was constantly no, wetting his I, pants. I, no, I, they weren't an intimidating bunch. But the problem was there was no soundproof glass. There was no soundproofing between us and the actors. You couldn't even turn a page while someone was delivering a line. But we recorded all in one open room. So everybody had to be completely quiet. And it wasn't a soundproof place either. The main problem was that we were on a street corner with a stop sign. Every motorcycle, every car, every dog, every, anything that made noise outside, we had to stop. <laughs> and do it again and stop. <laughs> and do it again. And that was a nightmare. Wednesdays and Thursdays were garbage day. So there was a lot of waiting. So if a motorcycle pulled up, you just have to do another take, or did you guys figure out some weird timing system? Was someone on lookout for no, loud vehicles? No, we just had to do another take. How much of a pain in the ass was that? A big one. Okay. <laughs> a giant pain in the ass. <laughs> so it was a real uh, ground roots effort, a real uh, mom and pop recording. It seemed um, really amateur time as far as where they chose to do it. I'm sure at the time I rolled my eyes and went, really, this is where we're doing this? I hope the person isn't listening whose studio this was. Chris, why were you recording here? That's where the production company, I guess they owned the property or that's where they were renting that property. And again, they'd never done a game before. And so do you think it was just, well, it doesn't need to be perfect. There could be some noise in the background. Ignorance. It was just they didn't know how to do it right. So, Paul, is that something where you and the other actors, uh, after recording sessions, we just kind of commiserate with each other and talk about, like, God, it's so unprofessional. Can you believe this? Oh, it, it was happening there. It wasn't just that, after. <laughs> there was a lot of laughter. A laughter about, oh, are you serious? Really? But, you know, as long as the check clears, that's all I care about. <laughs> Classic liquid. As long as the check clears, that's all I care about. It felt like a, I don't know why in my mind it felt like a movie set. It wasn't, but I just, I don't know. I just remember feeling really excited because I'd never recorded with other actors. Something that I think is what helped us be the leader in a game voiceover from that point on. Uh, was the fact that we did it with multiple actors at once. Oh, everything I did was with somebody else, which was really different from uh, other games then and now. I got to record with Snake. He was there. For the actors, I mean, that's what you want. You know, you want to be able to play off of somebody. Anytime Snake was with someone, that actor was with David. And that way we had much better interaction uh, with them, a much better emotional connection with the two actors. And on top of that, we had to do it to picture matching timing. We got there, and we <laughs> you get to read over it, run through it once, and then then record it. So what all we were doing was was matching with English language what the Japanese had done already. Or I guess the characters' heads would move too yes, a little bit. Yes, you also bit. have to match the head movement. You had to match if they you know, shook their fist or pointed at something. Yeah, so just like anime, it's, you have to fit English words into Japanese phrases, and that can be difficult. It's like one of those Japanese animes. Yeah. You can't change a word without um, somebody calling Tokyo and getting it cleared from three different people. So, uh, you know, there were times when I'd be like, look, can I say it like this because this will be cooler? And they'd make the call and they'd find out, you know, and 15 minutes later they'd say, uh, no. As I remember, we kind of recorded in order, which is unheard of now. We were doing eight-hour days. Now, now, you, now you never do more than four hours, but, but it was like a movie shoot. During the breaks, you would go, you literally, you'd go and sit in the kitchen of this house. You know, I mean, and it's a, it was a kitchen, you know, kind of a rundown Hollywood kitchen. And, you know, people were bringing their lunch and you could go in the fridge. And there was something very relaxed about this experience in, in that respect for me. You know, we'd all hang out and I got to know Chris uh, pretty well. And I mean, she's one of my all time favorite people now. I like to keep the energy light in the room. I like to keep my actors happy. I remember one time 
they were having a conversation in Japanese and the, basically the translation was, it's so much more fun here. The voice recordings are so much more serious in Japan. So what were you like as a director back then? Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> she's a supportive director. Uh, she can be intimidating when she needs to be, but she's mostly there to help. And, and she's just got a number of great methods and tricks to get to, to motivate people into where she needs them to go. It's one thing that she is just wonderful at, with very few words getting you to um, get what she has in mind or what the producer has in mind. She is one of my favorite people on the planet, on the Captain Planet, <laughs> and she has this terrific way of boring into the back of your head when she's talking at you to say, now try it like this and try it like this, and I, you know, you just kind of lock eyes with her. She's very good. I, I mean, I always go on and on and on about Chris Zimmerman because she's such a good director, and I just think she brought great performances out of everyone. Chris, I'm curious. How did you find the right level of energy to bring to this game? Since you hadn't done many video games before, were you coming at it with the Hanna-Barbera cartoon background and applying that to a video game? I came at it with an acting background. I can see by the movie, uh, the tone. You know, it's, it's kind of, you know, it has its very dark elements. But at the same time, a lot of the characters are so over the top. And I'm wondering how and you find that. And there's that. that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But, you know, my dear friend Revolver Ocelot with Patrick, it was more of a theatrical broad performance than a cartoony broad performance. I've been waiting for you, Solid Snake. Now we'll see if the man can live up to the legend. I didn't know it was going to be, be what it was. We just knew it was something really special, especially David. David just knew, immediately said, wow. Yeah, this is, this is, we're in for a ride. The first thing they showed me was the, the crash of the Heim D helicopter, you know, coming down and, and that whole sequence. And I was like, okay, this is pretty badass. He saw the difference um, comparing it to other, other games in the industry. They tried to give us an understanding that at Konami, this was a big game. David can focus so well and he's like laser beam focused and he was also very passionate about this david also speaks japanese and that voice man he doesn't really talk like that <laughs> i need another cigarette <laughs> so i auditioned for it and i thought i was playing a young soldier then i got the script and in the first scene was the scene in the in the submarine with uh campbell and he makes it clear that I've, I've retired. I've already moved up to Alaska to become a musher. I'm a musher. And, uh, and, and I've already sort of had it with the special forces. And he's come to like drag me back in. So I'm like, okay, I think this guy is older than me and he's gone through a lot already. And so it just started to, you know, the weight of it started to come into the voice. So it was really that first scene where I thought, you know, you should sound a little more like this. Halfway through the day, Chris played my original audition back for me and it sounded nothing like uh, what I was doing. <laughs> but I was like, well, I hope it's all right. Was that voice something that you'd like pull out with friends at a party or something? I mean, or is it just, did it just come to you there? Because I just feel like it's, it's just, it feels so practiced, you know, already. Yeah, well, it's practiced now, certainly. But, but um, no, at the time, it, it literally just came out on the day, that day. I mean, I was like... You know, what, how would I feel if I had been fighting and trying to get away? And You know, with you just sort of starting to practice a, a new voice for yourself on the spot, was that more of a strain on you for that recording session? Uh, no, not really. I, it, it sounds like it's a strain, but it's not. It's, uh, it's sort of a vocal trick uh, where I kind of just swallow the words back to my tonsils and my, you know, my vocal cords start to vibrate and, and it really doesn't, you know, it doesn't hurt or, or damage my voice or anything like that. Um, I mean, part of, part of the key to being a professional is, you know, a lot of people can do a funny voice, but the key is you got to be able to do it for eight hours in a day. 
Hey, Chris, I, I don't know if you've seen any, uh, if, if you haven't, it's, they're very entertaining, but there's mashups where it's every moment where Snake had to just ask a word in the form of a question for clarification. That was Questions. Like... <laughs> Asking. <laughs> Microphone. <laughs> Behind D, Metal Gear. Oh my God, it made us crazy. <laughs> <laughs> we did have some conversations about that, but again, there's nothing I can do about it. The cutscenes are already done. His lips are already flapping. You know, it's like, weirdly, it's difficult to ask questions as snake you know I, I tend to you know the cadence of it just goes down and not up like what you know and so a lot of times i would ask questions with a period at the end you know uh and and try to take some of the sting off it there but uh, but yeah that was definitely something that stood out to me you know i had great fun with kim mai on the line uh you know i never knew an analyst of military technology could be so cute <laughs> You're just flattering me. I believe it was Greg Eagles who played the... He played the ninja, but I think he also played the um, the DARPA chief. It was actually Decoy Octopus. Uh, spoilers. Um, <laughs> and he's an African-American gentleman. And I said, that's one of the secret black projects. And he's like, what the hell do you know about the secret black project? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely there were alternate takes. There was probably outtakes. Where those would be... I don't. I wouldn't even know because that company, the production company, doesn't exist anymore. They might exist uh, somewhere at Konami in Japan. I need information about Metal Gear. Huh? Metal Gear? You know, my first days with Otacon when he's he's wet his pants and he's been in the uh, the <laughs> I save him from the locker and uh, we 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 immediately bonded over that scene. I think that whole opening scene, you know, being trapped in the closet and scared to death and kind of looking so young and boyish, I I think I, I just kind of took my cues from that. And, you know, I mean, somebody who is, we, you know, afraid enough and seemingly young enough that they would actually wet their pants in fear. Um, and I kind of took it from there. I always work alone. Alone? Are you an otaku too? Come on, get out. Were you jealous of David Hayter's role since he originally came in for Snake? Did you? Would you rather be the action star hero rather than the, the nerd? <laughs> well, you know, of course we all want to be the action star hero. And I mean, that's the brilliance of the game because when you play it, you are the action star hero. I, I really kind of settled into Otacon and actually began to really enjoy, enjoy my particular place in the game. Chris, was it tough to keep pronunciations in this game straight? Like, I know it's a super nerdy cut. But I think like Meryl, Debbie Mae West calls him Otakon versus other characters calling him Otakon. I think that that might have just been a mistake. <laughs> a lot of the Japanese words, I, it was my first experience working with a Japanese client. Um, and it, it was hard. Like I'd say that my percentage of pronouncing the words correctly now is 80, 90 percent. And back then it was zero. <laughs> Octagon, octagon, we call him sometimes too. <laughs> Snake, please don't kill her. Are you insane? Please, she's a good person. You'd know that if you talked to her. I don't remember if Tasia Valenza was there or if I was just working to recording. The Tasia stuff, that's Sniper Wolf, right? Is that? Yes. Okay. Why? Why? I loved you. Yeah, that was beautiful. Anytime that you have breakdowns like that, it's it's a little bit tricky because you have to allow the actor the space to do it in. You have to give them the time to do it. You have to give them the patience to do it. Because to become that vulnerable, um, the actor has to feel very, very safe in order to go there. And he did it. He went there and he. It, now I'm getting sad right now just thinking about it. It certainly has turned into probably my favorite scene of of the entire series. That whole sequence with Sniper Wolf. Snake, you said that love could bloom on the battlefield. But I couldn't save her. 
as written, it seemed to me it wasn't a kind of a sexual lust as much. It was, it was just this kind of genuine crush almost on her. And for me, it kind of helped to sort of lock Otakon in, in a way, in, in my, you know, in my thinking about him. Snake! What was she fighting for? What am I fighting for? What are you fighting for? I think the most challenging thing, there was one, there is one long monologue that Otakon has talking about nuclear destruction and, and there's all sorts of, you know, nuclear explosions and pictures and all that stuff. And I had to do that and match it to all of those pictures, time it out right. I remember that as being the, the most challenging. Yeah. You know, and then a truck would drive by and we'd have to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> but I finally learned how to like people. I'm not afraid anymore. Well, you and I are more alike than I thought. That very end scene where Otacon romantically mounts the snowmobile. <laughs> so, this is where we say goodbye to our loves as well. And we kept telling them, this is not, you know, Americans, it would be like pals. You know, it would be like, you know, guys. So can we like macho it up a little bit? And they're like, no, it has to be like the Japanese version. So that's why Otacon and Snake are riding off into the sunset if Meryl dies. <laughs> It's led to a lot of fan fiction that's really stellar oh, stuff. Yeah. I don't know if you're aware of this. <laughs> we all know. We all know. He's been naked in a box. He's done all kinds of crazy things. So, Christopher, is there one line that uh, the fans always ask you to say? What's what's the go-to Otacon line as far as you can well, tell? Uh, they, uh, everybody always wants to hear, do you think that love could bloom on a battlefield? That's just... And and it's that's so interesting to me, really. Because I, I don't know if that's something I ever would have... I don't know as I ever would have picked that line. It, it, it also, I think, for me, really reflects the um, overall sensitivity of the game, if you will. The the kind of there, there's a there's philosophy behind it. You know, it's a it's a war game that's anti-war. Can I mean, if you really think about that line, it's quite deep. It's mm -hmm. quite philosophical, actually. There's a, a lot of brilliance in that first game. I liked helping to create um, when Snake dies. Snake, Snake, Snake! <laughs> I was instrumental in um, you guys hearing that for all these games. <laughs> Snake, what happened? Snake, Snake! Actually, no, I didn't even realize the, um, when we said the Snake, Snake, Snake that that was the game over. Snake, snake, snake! I've done several ringtones for people with that. I had one guy told me that he had to make sure he answered the phone before the third ring. <laughs> <laughs> Are you guys just laughing uncontrollably after every take of that? You must think this is the silliest thing, right? Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> it was kind of awesome. Is there anyone you like? I've never been interested in anyone else's life. So you are all alone. What are your memories of the voice behind Meryl? Debbie Mae West, very sexy, very sexy girl, also very smart and intelligent. I worked very closely with David Hayter on, on both games that I did. And, you know, he's a really good actor. He's, he is Solid Snake. What was your sense of, like, Meryl as a character as you were kind of, as you were, like, bringing her to life with the English voice acting? She's a badass. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> she's just, she's cool. She was sexy. And... Oh, hurry, hurry. Make love to me. Snake, I want you. It's interesting you, you mentioned her being sexy because I think that game, it tried to use her as a sex object every once in a while in a somewhat strange way. I'm thinking mainly of like, there's a lot of close-ups of her butt. Right. In the game. Did you have her boobs? Her butt and her boobs. She's doing all right. Do you remember having impressions of was that bizarre to see at the time in a game? I've never played a video game in my life, so I didn't know if it was bizarre or not. It's mostly butt. I really and have boobs. never played one video game. No. Is she alive? I'm not sure. She was alive a few hours ago. Poor girl kept calling your name.
you should know, Cam, that you did a really good job with that voice. Uh, people love the character of Liquid, and I think a gigantic part of that is the English voice. Oh, thank you. The lines were written so in such a delicious fashion that to just be kind of an a-hole, you know, to be snotty and jealous is a fun thing to play. It's a lot more fun than being the hero, you know. He loved it. And I think his favorite thing was one of the days we had, I believe it was some marketing people there from Europe. And the one of the gentlemen said, what what part of England are you from? Uh, and Cam was like, uh, I was born in the valley. <laughs> <laughs> but he took that as a really high compliment that someone from England actually thought that he was British. The voice of liquid stink. That's awesome. Hey, Cam, since it was so long ago, do you mind if we play you a clip from the game and you can kind of react to your own voice here? Uh-oh. Okay. You're still alive. I won't die as long as you still live. It looks like your revolution was a failure. Just because you've destroyed Metal Gear doesn't mean I am done fighting. Fighting? What are you really after? A world where warriors like us are honored as we once were. As we should be. That was Big Boss's fantasy. It was his dying wish. <sighs> when he was young, during the Cold War, the world needed men like us. We were valued then. We were desired. But things oh, are different now. What do you think of that, Cam? Wow, that guy's, that guy's awesome. <laughs> see if you can get him on your show. <laughs> I think I was pretty damn good. Yeah, that's why we love you, Cam. Well, yeah, and so I'm going, well, I got to correct what I do when people ask because I've been pitching him down, but he just sounds like someone from Hogwarts. I was much younger. My, my scrotum hung higher, and uh, uh, gravity was my friend. Liquid Snake! Did you like my sunglasses? Well, what's interesting about that role, Cam, is that not only were you playing Liquid, you also had to have another more American voice for Master Miller. I've lived in Alaska longer than you, so call me if you have any questions about the flora or fauna out here. Do you remember that dichotomy? How did I do it all? You're a miracle man. Do you remember? I'm amazing. Well, it was interesting because you were playing Liquid impersonating another character. Do you remember that being a challenging right. role? No. Um, kidding aside, it's what I do. I love what I do, and I'm good at what I do, and it's not hard. I, you know, I could say something more humble, like, oh, it was very hard, and it took me forever, and I lied awake at night trying to figure out how I could do it, but it came easy. Yeah. I cannot lie. Les enfants terribles, the terrible children. Hey, Chris. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious, can you talk about just the phrase, les enfants terribles? <laughs> like, the terrible children. Terrible children. Terrible yeah. children. It must have been and a tough... terrible children. Those are the clones. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Was it a weird thing when you saw that in the first script? Like, okay, I guess I have to learn how to pronounce this in French. Yeah, it was then... hard. It was hard to teach uh, les enfants terribles. Very it nice. was hard for the non-French speakers um, to be able to say that. La les enfants terribles. <laughs> 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 but if you want to talk about a funny thing to say... Yeah. Shalashaska? Shalashaska. Yeah, Shalashaska. Patrick Zimmerman could not, for the life of him, say that word. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I still communicate with him from time to time. And I will bring up, that's why I can't say it right, because he would always put extra syllables in the Shalashlaka. <laughs> <laughs> Well, everything revolving around Ocelot with the uh, lolly lolly low and all that it gets, just gets more and more complicated. He's a wordy gentleman. He's a very, very verbose gentleman. This is the greatest handgun ever made. The Colt Single Action Army. Six bullets. More than enough to kill anything that moves. Now I'll show you why they call me Revolver. I personally am a big fan of Revolver Ocelot. I just think that 
he brought all his Shakespearean training and turned him into this just absolutely insane genius. His speech about whatever pistol that he's super into uh, is just like stuck with me my entire life. The way he he delivered it with like such confidence. And it's like, wait, now I know about this Colt single action army and why <laughs> it's the best handgun in the world. It's just, it was such a confident performance. Yeah. He, uh, he loved that. He loves acting that guy. So what about you? Want to stay for the show? Patrick, I'm not sure that I can find him right now. You know, there's that ex and husband thing. <laughs> And not that it's the most relevant thing to the story, but yes, Chris Zimmerman Selter was at one point married to the voice actor that played Revolver Ocelot. How's that sneaking suit working out? I'm nice and dry, but it's a little hard to move. Bear with it. It's designed to prevent hypothermia. This is Alaska, you know. Jennifer Hale is one of my favorite actresses. I met Jennifer in a acting class that I taught and immediately started to try to find work for her. You know, why she was Russian and then not Russian and then uh, accented and not accented. Those were all Japanese choices. I don't know why they were made. Well, that's really interesting. So for characters like Mei Ling and then Naomi who come back in four, the choice to like change the accent was coming from Japan? Yes. And no insight as to why that would be? Mm, no. Huh, does that kind of inconsistency bother you, or are you more of a project-to-project kind of person? No, it did bother me, because they were characters that existed before, and they just, I don't really know why they decided to do that. This is Raven's territory. Peter Lurie, Vulcan Raven. Yeah, what was that Uh, like? Peter was a newer actor to me at the time. I knew his dad, Alan, very well, and Peter just, I just remember the passion that he brought to it. Snake! And Peter Lurie, everybody. Chris was very key to remind me that, you know, he's very much a mystic. He's very much, you know, a shaman. You gotta remember, you gotta have both. You have to kind of split the split the difference. There's time to be a badass and there's time to be very spiritual and you know, explain to him that it's not all just, you know, blood and guts. So I hope I I hope I gave that to the audience. I think I did. Snakes don't belong in Alaska. <laughs> you should crawl on the ground like the snake you are. I, I was laughing because I'm going, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember when I used to do that. I remember when that was my bit. Mm-hmm. It, I, I think one of the one of the first things I ever got known for was um, I, I provided the ADR for Brandon Lee in the movie The Crow. <laughs> but I remember I remember doing people love the laughs because for some reason I, I, I seem to sustain something that not a lot of people do. I'm, okay, yay me. <laughs> <laughs> so Chris is like, with this performance, we want to hear the laugh. Make sure to get that in there at some point. Absolutely. Those boys are totally insane. They wouldn't hesitate to launch. My father, who unfortunately just passed away last year at 91, was a longtime uh, actor. I mean, he was president, right? Yeah, he's an arms tech president. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The threat of nuclear war isn't gone. In fact, it's greater than it's ever been. What was it like to work with your father on that project? It, you know, it's funny. My dad and I, we, we never saw each other, um, especially back then. You, 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 uh, you would work days and days apart. I suppose those characters never really cross paths either. Yeah, so. I suppose so. Yeah. He was great. He was, they loved him because my father goes, went back to the early days. He was a, a radio voice guy. So it must've been fun for everybody involved to have this, you know, legend of VO in this tiny house where they were recording the first Metal Gear Solid. I, they love my dad. Uh, I mean, I love my dad. Everyone did. Anyway, Metal Gear was going to be formally adopted after the results of this exercise were analyzed. And after weeks of work in Hollywood, they wrapped up the game. The characters of Metal Gear Solid found their English voices, and the actors went on with the rest of their lives. But then the game came out. You know, we definitely finished up, and that was that. And um, and then, you know, there was a lag time of eight months at least until the game came out. And then, and I also read the reviews. Uh, you know, which at the time were in the magazines. 
you know, the, the gamer magazines. And I, I did, you know, I, I picked up a few of those and I was, I was really pleased at the time that the voice acting got mentioned because I didn't know whether anyone would really care. And I, you know, I, I just, you know, th there was no YouTube or anything to be able to see. And I really wanted to see the work. I wanted to see what I had done, but you, you got to get a certain distance in the game before you could, you meet Otacon. <laughs> and I kept getting killed. You know, there was this sort of, I'm sure some sort of deep psychological issue around, I'm just trying to get to my work, but I keep getting <laughs> killed. <laughs> you got to do a lot of complicated stuff to get down there. You're playing with a remote controlled missile and stuff and right. guiding it through a poison right. room. And like, there's a lot of tests between you and meeting Otacon. A lot. But I, you know, I finally got there and I, I wound up ultimately finishing the game. Look out, Snake! The guys who stole my stealth prototypes are in there with you. You know, it's never how you imagine it's going to be. Um, and at a certain point, you don't have much control. But yes, I was actually very proud of the work. We had no idea what it was going to be like. You know, we just thought we were making another game. And it, it was huge because it was a game changer. It was a game changer for uh, the, in, the gaming industry. And again, while the rules changed, when they came back and made the next one, like, no, 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 we have to do this the right way. So can you talk about how surreal it was to do the Twin Snakes recording for the GameCube where you had to re-record the entire game? Because we all got to be together again. Uh, it was a little bit like old home week. It was kind of weird to redo the whole thing again because they could just use the tracks. But I have a feeling that had something to do with... Um, the union rules and it's called um uh, i'm as bad at being a lawyer as i am at technical uh, technical things uh incorporation so when you take something from one project and put it into another project there's a certain price that has to be paid and i believe it's the entire amount that the however many days that that actor worked you would put the same amount in there so it ended up being financially better off for them to redo it do you have any preference between the two sets of readings, like uh, Metal Gear 1 versus Twin Snakes? Uh, I would say that we probably all understood it a lot better in Twin Snakes. Um, so part of me would lead to that. However, I also think that that's when they changed the accents The first at first. Yeah. They backed off the accents there. And that I preferred having them. And there's also something about just the freshness of the first one. Over the time of the series, I, you know, it, it has really become apparent to me how many fans there are worldwide. You know, I have people come up to me and say these amazing things, like, you know, I could never have gotten through high school without you, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? I've met so many people over the years that are gamers and when they find out I'm Meryl they freak out and they give me a lot of love and I feel like I have a lot of fans because of it and I mean I'll drop the, the you know if I meet some young guys and I can tell they're gamers I, I will certainly brag a little bit and, and let people know that I'm Meryl and it's really fun and exciting to have people just like see their eyes and you know I, I yeah exactly like you right now. The one I get the most requests for is, uh, I hear it's amazing when the famous purple stuffed worm in Flamjaw space with a tuning fork does a raw blink on Harry Carey Rock. I need scissors. 61. Um, they make me yell snake a lot. Snakes don't belong in Alaska. You always get the guys who go, you know, in, in, in option 12, when you were actually had a chance to kill him and you decided not to, was that your own feeling about it or were you conflicted? And I always want to say, um, yes. Yes. I think I'm going to cross out this next question. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I started doing the cons, you know, doing the comic cons and stuff, I have, you know, all these different eight by 10 pictures of various characters and I've done them up according to the ones that are asked for the most. Second to Leonardo is Liquid. And second to Liquid is um, Kaneda from Akira. So, David, compared to the other actors, uh, they all have kind of vague memories of the recording and stuff. But it seems like you really remember the lines well. <laughs> well, why well I've played the game. 
So, you know, and I played it a few times because I, A, because I'm a, an egotist and I want to hear my everything I do, and B, because I, I, I like a good video game. And so, um, so you know, it's nice to be able to understand the games from the perspective of the fans as well. Because it's, you know, it's hard, like Cam has done so many things since then. He doesn't have any recollection of what we did. But me, you know, I've mostly been writing. So, so basically, when it's Metal Gear, I, I, I invest myself and I try to remember what, what the world is all about so I can communicate with the fans. So how often does it come up in your life these days? Well, well, I'm on Twitter, so it comes up about two or three hundred times a day. <laughs> uh, you know, people are like, people are like, why are you still talking about it? And I'm like, because people just would never leave me alone about it, it, it which is fine. <laughs> like you guys. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, we'll hang up now, sir. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I always say I have the ideal level of fame. In fact, I'll tell you a story. I was having an argument with my bank. Uh, because they had done a thing which cost me $30,000, uh, and it was their mistake. And then, so the guy calls me up, and he goes, look, it happened a year ago. We no longer have the recording of the thing, so we can't, we don't know, you know, we can't prove that it was our fault, and there's really nothing we can do. And I was like, okay, you know, fine. And I was all upset, and he goes, but on a personal level, I really appreciate what you do for a living. And I was like, oh, are you a Metal Gear fan? And he was like, yeah. Uh, so, well, that doesn't make me feel any better about my 30 grand. <laughs> it's weird because I got Metal Gear, and then the next year I ended up writing the movie X-Men. So that changed my entire life and made me – I didn't have to be an actor anymore. Like I still love being an actor, but I didn't have to like bang my head against a wall and try to get parts and try to survive. Suddenly I had money and I, I was – you know, I, I was getting – I was writing big movies, and so, um, so, Metal Gear sort of became my one acting outlet. I said, "I'll just, I'll keep doing that, but I won't do anything else," and uh, and that was really cool. And so, it allowed me to do it with enormous confidence, without having to worry about what my next job was going to be, because um, I didn't care. So it was really X Men that changed my life. Um, but it's weird because it's metal gear that I'm most well known for. Wait, since you've done so much in your career and I mean, you mentioned how proud you are of X-Men. Do you consider <clears throat> yeah. yourself extremely proud of the work on Metal Gear Solid looking back at the, its entire run? Yeah. Here and there. I mean, I feel like, you know, I'm very hard on myself as an actor and, and as a writer, I, you know, there are times when people are like, Oh, you sucked in such and such or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, I kind of did. Um, you know, there are, there are moments in the performance where I'm like it, where I feel it gets to, too much of that sort of sing-song cadence and 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 there's some lines that were just too difficult to make sense of you know so i just sort of barrel through them um but overall i mean i i i'm happy with it i i i really like the the performance in the first game in particular uh and then towards the end i feel like i really got a, a new understanding of the character so so I think Peace Walker and, and Metal Gear 4 are probably my favorite performances. So Cam, how much did you stay in touch with the Metal Gear Solid series going forward? Obviously you were in 2 and then the remake of the first one, but is it something that you check in on every once in a while? Um, well, if I'm not in it, I don't. <laughs> it's interesting moving forward though because... Your voice for Master Miller, who's the person that Liquid Snake's impersonating, then became an important character in the later entries because they were prequels. And so it's interesting because there's an actor right. named Robin Downs, Robin Atkins Downs, who then has to do the voice based on your impersonation in the first game. It's very confusing. Why didn't they use me, huh? That's a great question. Amazing question. But then it would have been that Liquid Snake's too good, that his impersonation is 100% correct. <laughs> and this time he came back as a kid. Have people talked to you about that much? No, I just heard about it. And so, you know, I certainly can't get upset if he's, you know, supposed to be a nine-year-old or whatever it is. If you were voicing a nine-year-old Liquid Snake, how would that sound? Like he went, like, what's his name from Hogwarts, the blonde kid? Draco Malfoy. Yeah, that's young Liquid. You're absolutely right. 
unfortunately, uh, I think we're kind of in a in a celebrity dominated uh, venue now, even with the games. And I think you know that's great for the um, for the viewers. They get to see their favorite uh, personalities. But I think when we were first starting out, you really were allowed to. I know it's probably an overused term, but play. You're allowed to get out there and, you know, well, you're going to play a beagle in this one. And now you're going to play a, a seven foot tall, uh, you know, behemoth. And you got to roll around in those kind of parts. And I think that's really what made those those 90s and the early 2000s so much fun. Chris is one of those kind of people. I, I think it's almost kind of a throwback to old Hollywood. She takes care of the people that she knows takes care of her. I'm not an enormous fan of stunt casting because I've had it backfire so many times. I've had celebrities suck so badly at voiceover that they were unusable, that they literally had to get a sound match and still use the person's name. Now, that's not to say that all of them are that way. I have worked with some amazing celebrities. Um, and I will say that Kiefer is one of them. Oh yeah. Mr. Sutherland did a great job. He, he was very professional. He was very directable. He wanted this, uh, to be good. And he, he just, he did a really good job. And I do know that, uh, Kojima had always wanted to have, uh, you know, a Hollywood star part of the process. Right, right. I'm sure it's fun for him. I mean, he's such a Hollywood fan. It makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> I know a lot of fans have noticed just how quiet um, Big Boss can be throughout the game. And they're wondering, like, how much of this comes down to just the direction that Kojima said we wanted him to be more like Mad Max and stoic and quiet versus how much is it like just Kiefer Sutherland's time and he wasn't able to be there that much? No, so. Kiefer, Kiefer, uh, I think we did at least 20 sessions with him. Wow. So it had it was not about that at all. I believe that they just didn't they I, I honestly just felt that um, it was the way that this particular project had gone. People were going crazy with uh, five with phantom pain. I would I did a uh, a con in Malta, and these guys who were so smart and they they know Metal Gear inside and out. They've got a couple of YouTube channels where they uh, discuss all what, what's going to happen, what was going to happen in in pain, and how I was going to be involved in pain. And no, I'm not involved in pain. And then oh, David's going to be in it. And um, we already knew that no, that's not going to happen. It's you know. Finally, I posted something at one point. I said it was it was near to the release, and I said thank goodness it's going to be released because then my friends will realize that I, I was telling them the truth. Immediately on Twitter and my Facebook page, people are saying, "Ah, there's something hidden in what he's saying." Of course, he means something else is going on. It's like, no, I'm being, <laughs> I'm being honest. <laughs> well, I was so annoyed by the Metal Gear Five uh, debacle that um, you know people are like, "Are you going to play the game?" And I'm like, "Yeah, that'd be a, a 60 hours of humiliation. That I can't wait to get to." Um, so no, so I didn't play. I haven't played the latest. Uh, uh, the latest two iterations because uh, it's just too painful. I'm aware of the ones I did and, you know, if people want to talk to me about those, I, I can talk about them. That time in the booth is, it's a real relationship and it, you just love them, you know, you just love these people. But it must have been a little bit heartbreaking for you having worked with David Hayter for all those years to get the news that you're not going to be using them this time around? It was very difficult, Yes. It was very difficult. It was sad. It was, um, it, you know, it, 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 it wasn't the same. And to me, it was a different, a different process. If you're a Metal Gear Solid fan, you've heard a lot of rumors and speculation about how the voice acting casting went for Snake in Metal Gear Solid Five. This is Hater's perspective. I was visiting the uh, recording booth, uh, the studio where we did Metal Gear 4 and Peace Walker. And one of the producers from Metal Gear was there uh, that I know. And so I said, well, let's go grab a beer. And we went to grab a beer. And so I said, so I understand you're gearing up for Metal Gear. And um, he was like, yeah. And I said, okay, well, do you, do you need me to do anything? Should we discuss the deal or whatever? He's like, no, uh, you know, we, we won't be needing you at, at the moment. 
So we'll let you know if anything changes. And that was basically it. So uh, then I talked to Chris Zimmerman, and she said, yeah, we're going forward, but it, it looks like they're going to try to replace you. And so I was like, okay, well, let me know if that – because they tried to do that before, and it never worked. They tried to get voice matches, and that never happened. So I said, okay, well, let me know if, uh, uh, if that doesn't work out, and I'll come back. And if not, I guess that's a pretty good run. I can't, I can't imagine how that would have felt. Well, it's it's horrible, and it's uh, it's humiliating. But I work in Hollywood, and I'm a screenwriter, so I kind of get that. I mean, I get fired from every job I get. I mean, that's just the nature of of the business. So there's a great. I tweeted a great painting that I saw uh, of a. It's a baby wolf that's been shot with an arrow, and it's lying there dead, and there's all this blood, and it says "Me before." And then there's this huge wolf next to it with like 20 arrows in its back and all, you know, all this blood running down. It's still got its teeth gritted and it says me now. So that's, that's kind of how you, how you get with these things. So, you know, I mean, it, it, it was annoying to me because I felt like I'd given a lot to the series and I'd really helped promote it and been, a, and been, you know, a, a, a big uh, cheerleader for the whole thing. Um, but at the same time, I, 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 I genuinely feel that the run I had as snake was, was remarkable. And you, you get that, if you get that once in your career, that's amazing. So, so I'm very happy with that as well. And I don't, you know, I don't have any ill will towards Kiefer Sutherland or anything like that. Um, the whole thing could have been handled better and a little more respectfully, but, uh, uh, but I'm not going to cry about it. So you mentioned like the sound alikes, was that even for the PSP games then, like Peace Walker and stuff? Was that in the table? As far as I know, I mean, I had to re-audition. They made me re-audition for Metal Gear 3 uh, to play Naked Snake. They made me re-audition to play Old Snake. Um, you know, and the whole time they were trying to find somebody else to, to do it. I heard that Kojima tried to, he asked one of the producers on Metal Gear 3 to ask Kurt Russell if he would take over uh, for that game, to, but he didn't want to do it. Do you, um, so is it just his love of Hollywood where he's always wanted to work with this A-list talent or what, what's promoting that? I don't know. I mean, I think I, 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 and like, I don't know Kojima at all really. Um, but I never felt like he was a particularly big fan of mine. I don't think he liked the fact that I got a lot of attention for the role when he was meant to be the rock star of the whole thing. Um, but that's just conjecture. Yeah. You know. He seems like a um, complex man. But, oh, he's complex. <laughs> Definitely complex. Would you ever consider with him, with Kojima leaving Konami now, do you think there's any chance you'd ever want to work with him again? I feel like you two are so connected to the outside world. Do you feel <laughs> any con- connection to him on the inside world between you two? No. I uh, No, I was kind of hoping that Konami would bring me back now that he was gone. Um no, I think he handled it pretty badly, and I, I, I've got no particular love for Kojima. I respect him, and I think he's a brilliant uh, game maker. Um, I don't know him as a person, and, and uh, uh, as a businessman, I was not impressed. So, um, so, no, I don't feel any need to go back and work with him again. Yeah. Well, we don't need to dwell on uh, the dark days, but you should know that People love your early performances so much, especially in that first game. I mean, the combination of your voice in juxtaposition with Cam Clark's, like, it is just gaming bliss. Like, it blew all (laughs) of our minds when we were growing up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was really fun. I just did a panel with with, uh, Cam, and we were doing, you know, and he's like, brother, you know, do you like my sunglasses, snake? (laughs) And uh, so, yeah, we we had a great deal of fun on that game. It was an oddly magical time. We didn't know how to do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And there's something very exciting creatively when you are faced with a task that you've not done before. It was such a pleasure to work on, and I'm still to this day very proud of being part of it. That was probably the first time that I really said, wow, I'm really part of something. And I think it's one of those things where you always say to yourself when you're doing work, I hope I hope I do something that will always be remembered. And, and I think that was it. Of course, Kojima's mind uh, is, is everything. Uh, the concept, 
We changed the way games were, were, were made. And I think, I think the acting had a lot to do with that. You know, I, I don't want to aggrandize it too much, but I, I feel like, I feel like it's a, that game is a demarcation line in the history of video games. You know, the, that was the first time I think that voice acting actually became important. It's kind of a cool thing to have been part of that. I just got such great respect for, uh, especially David. He's just, number one, very talented, um, but number two, just a good man. From the bottom of my heart, as a huge fan, your work means a lot to us. Uh, so thank you. Well, thank you, gentlemen. That's very kind of you to say. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, we were And uh, you obviously work in an excellent office, so, uh, <laughs> so well done. That's half the key to life. That's it, Tim. That's the story of recording the first Metal Gear Solid. It made me love it more. So we do want to thank a lot of people here. Obviously, we've been working on this for a while. Uh, we want to thank Ryan Payton from Camouflage. Thanks, Ryan. Working on his game Republic. He put us in contact with a lot of these people. Really appreciate it. Uh, Chris Zimmerman Salter. Obviously, not only do we appreciate her work, but she was awesome to work with here and was the main reason we were able to line up all these interviews. Yes. A fantastic job. Um, Marcus Stewart, former Game Reformer intern, captured the gameplay footage if you're watching this on YouTube. Thank you for infiltrating Shadow Moses once again, Marcus. You really did a smooth job. Um, and then we want to thank you for watching or listening to this episode of the Game Reformer Show. Yeah, thank you. And that's it for the first Metal Gear Solid, right, Tim? That's right. But... But... I love all the characters of Metal Gear Solid, but you know who also got attached to them? Who? The voice actors. I'm just bummed that uh, it's not going to happen again. It was extra extra sad when I heard that uh, the um, the actor who played who created uh, uh, Campbell, the Japanese actor, passed away. Oh, I didn't know. And that. there was a rumor. Yeah, there was a rumor back then. It was about a year ago, maybe more. That out of respect to him, that that um, that uh, Campbell would never be coming back. That's that's what I heard that uh, Kojima said. And it was like, wow, man, that kind of, that sucks. Isn't Meryl loved? I mean, I think she's a great character. Meryl should have her own game. I agree. Wholeheartedly. It, it's tough in the timeline, but totally they should jump forward and give her like the Metal Gear Rising treatment, mm -hmm. except just with Meryl. Yes. It'd be What's Metal Gear Rising? That's one that stars Quentin Flynn's character. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's set kind of in the future, so it takes place after four. Is he one of the snakes? Write your congressman. Yeah. Write the producers of Metal Gear and say, we demand a Liquid Snake sequel. Mount a campaign. Mm -hmm. Let's get out there. Let's, let, let's go back to Metal Gear and say, you know what? I've been in cryogenic sleep. <laughs> let's, bring, let's bring Vulcan and Raven back. Come on, it's a video game. We can all do it. I think the crows and ravens all come back and piece him back together. I like they, it. They took those parts. Like, of, a, like a golem made yeah. of, of crows. Okay, I'm into yeah, it. It's perfect. Ooh, well, I like that. that yeah. We got something. Run with it, guys. Hey, let's go, <laughs> man. Just spitball in here. So, Chris, I'm curious. Are you looking forward to working with Kojima theoretically in the future? Do you think you're locked in? I would as hope his... so. Yeah. I would hope so. You know, I've enjoyed working with him. I know he must have enjoyed my work or I wouldn't have been back so many times. Um, again, he doesn't speak English and I'm certainly not fluent in Japanese. Uh, so we know each other's work probably more than we know each other. I, I would hope that I'd get the opportunity when he resurfaces. She's done everything. She's, she's, uh, she's the one constant over here. Yeah. It's because she's good. Mm -hmm. There's two constants really through Metal Gear. There's Ocelot and, and Chris. That's it. That's two that's, things. Oh, wow. That's right. That's it. Okay. Take care. Oh,